page 186. We're now going on to part five about Justin. Ooh, boo. Part five, Justin, page 186. Sometimes I think my head is so big because it is so full of dreams. From John Merrick in Bernard Pomerance's The Elephant Man. Page 187. Olivia's brother. The first time I meet Olivia's little brother, I have to admit I'm totally taken by surprise. I shouldn't be, of course. Olivia's told me about his syndrome. He has even described what he looks like. But she's also talked about all his surgeries over the years, so I guess I assumed he'd be more normal looking by now. Like when a kid is born with a cleft lip and has plastic surgery to fix it, sometimes you can't even tell except for a little scar above the lip. I guess I thought her brother would have the, some scars here and there, but not this. I definitely wasn't expecting to see this little kid in a baseball cap who's sitting in front of me right now. Actually, there are two kids sitting in front of me. One is a totally normal looking kid with curly blonde hair named Jack. The other is Augie. I like to think I'm able to hide my surprise. I hope I do. Surprise is one of those emotions that can be hard to fake though, whether you're trying to look surprised when you're not, or trying to not look surprised when you are. I shake his hand. I shake the other kid's hand. I don't want to focus on his face. Cool room, I say. Are you Vi's boyfriend? He says. I think he's smiling. Olivia pushes down his baseball cap. Is that a machine gun? The blonde kid asks, like I haven't heard that one before. And we talk about Zydeco for a bit. And then Vyas taking my hand and leading me out of the room. As soon as we close the door behind us, we hear them laughing. Ah, this is Vyas' boyfriend. I think of Julian. My bad. I'm from Brooklyn, one of them says. Olivia rolls her eyes as she smiles. Let's go hang out in my room, she says. We've been dating for two months now. I knew from the moment I saw her, the minute she sat down at our table in the cafeteria that I liked her. I couldn't keep my eyes off her. Really beautiful. The olive skin and the bluest eyes I've ever seen in my life. At first, she acted like she only wanted to be friends. I think she kind of gives off that vibe without even meaning to. Stay back. Don't even bother. She doesn't flirt like some other girls do. She looks you right in the eye when she talks to you, like she's daring you. So I just kept looking her right in the eye, too, like I was daring her right back. And then I asked her out, and she said yes which rocked. She's an awesome girl, and I love hanging out with her. She didn't tell me about August until our third date. I think she used the phrase a craniofacial abnormality to describe his face, or maybe it was craniofacial anomaly. I know the one word she didn't use was deformed, though, because that would have registered with me. So, what did you think? She asks me nervously the second we're inside her room. Are you shocked? No, I lie. She smiles and looks away. You're shocked. I'm not sure, I assure her. She's just like what, uh, he's just like what you said he'd be like. She nods and plops down on her bed. Kind of cute how she still has a lot of stuffed animals on her bed. She takes one of them, a polar bear, without thinking, and puts it in her lap. I sit down on the rolling chair by her desk. Her room is immaculate. When I was little, she says, there were lots of kids who never came back for a second play date. I mean, 
lots of kids. I even had friends who wouldn't come to my birthdays because he would be there. They never actually told me this, but I would get back, but it would get back to me. Some people just don't know how to deal with Ogie, you know. I nod. It's not even like they know they're being mean, she adds. They're just scared. I mean, let's face it. The face is a little scary, right? I guess, I answer. But you're okay with it, she asks me sweetly. You're not too freaked out or scared? I'm not freaked out or scared, I smile. She nods and looks down at the polar bear on her lap. I can't tell whether she believes me or not, but then she gives the polar bear a kiss on the nose and tosses it to me with a little smile. I think that means she believes me, or at least that she wants to. Page 190, Valentine's Day. I give Olivia a heart necklace for Valentine's Day, and she gives me a messenger bag she's made out of old floppy disks. Very cool how she makes things like that. Earrings out of pieces of circuit boards, dresses out of t-shirts, bags out of old jeans. She's so creative. I tell her she should be an artist someday, but she wants to be a scientist. A geneticist of all things, she wants to find cures for people like her brother, I guess. We make plans for me to finally meet her parents. A Mexican restaurant on Amesford Avenue near her house on Saturday night. All day long I'm nervous about it. And when I get nervous, my, my ticks come out. I mean, my ticks are always there, but they're not like they used to be when I was little. Nothing but a few hard blinks now, and occasionally head pull but when I'm stressed, they get worse, and I'm definitely stressing about meeting her folks. They're waiting inside when I get to the restaurant. The dad gets up and shakes my hand, and the mum gives me a hug. I give Augie a hello fist punch and kiss Olivia on the cheek before I sit down. It's nice to meet you, Justin. We've heard so much about you. Her parents couldn't be nicer put me at ease right away. The waiter brings over the menus, and I notice his expression the moment I lay eyes on August. But I pretend not to notice. I guess we're all pretending not to notice things tonight. The waiter, my ticks. The way August crushes the tortilla chips on the table and spoons the crumbs into his mouth. I look at Olivia, and she smiles at me. She knows. She sees the waiter's face. She sees my tics. Olivia is a girl who sees everything. We spend the entire dinner talking and laughing. Olivia's parents ask me about my music, how I got into the fiddle and stuff like that. And I tell them about how I used to play classical violin, but I got into Appalachian folk music and then Zydeco and they're listening to every word like they're really interested. They tell me to let them know the next time my band's playing at a gig so they can come and listen. I'm not used to all the attention, to be truthful. My parents don't have a clue about what I want to do with my life. They never ask. We never talk like this. I don't think they even know I traded my Baroque violin for an eight-string hard dangle hard danger fiddle two years ago. After dinner we go back to Olivia's for some ice cream. Their dog greets us at the door, an old dog, super sweet. She'd thrown up all over the hallway though. Olivia's mum rushes to get paper towels while the dad picks the dog up like she's a baby. What's up old girlie? He, she, he says and the dog's in heaven, tongue hanging out, tail wagging, legs in the air at awkward angles. Dad, tell Justin how you got Daisy, said Olivia. Yeah, says Augie. The dad smiles and sits, sits down in a chair with the dog still cradled in his arms. 
it's obvious he's told this story lots of times and they all love to hear it. So I'm coming home from the subway one day, he says, and a homeless guy I've never seen in this neighborhood before is pushing this floppy mutt in a stroller. And he comes up to me and says, hey, mister, want to buy my dog? And without even thinking about it, I say, sure, how much do you want? And he says, 10 bucks. So I give him the $20 I have in my wallet and he hands me the dog. Justin, I'm telling you, you've never smelled anything so bad in your life. She stank so much, I couldn't even tell you. So I took her right from there to the vet down the street, and then I brought her home. Didn't even call me first, by the way, the mum interjects as she cleans the floor to see if I'm okay with this to see if I'm okay with his bringing home some homeless guy's dog. The dog actually looks over at the mum when she says this, like she understands everything everyone is saying about her. She's a happy dog, like she knows she's lucked out that day finding his family. I kind of know how she feels. I like Olivia's family. They laugh a lot. My family's not like this at all. My mum and dad got divorced when I was four. They pretty much hate each other. I grew up spending half of every week in my dad's apartment in Chelsea and the other half in my mum's place in Brooklyn Heights. I have a half-brother who's five years older than me and barely knows I exist. For as long as I can remember, I've felt like my parents could hardly wait for me to be old enough to take care of myself. You can go to the store by yourself. Here's the key to the apartment. It's funny how there's a word like overprotective to describe some parents, but no word that means the opposite. What word do you use to describe parents who don't protect enough? Underprotective? Neglectful? Self-involved? Lame? All of the above? Olivia's family tell each other, I love you all the time. I can't remember, sorry, uh, I can't remember the last time anyone in my family said that to me. By the time I go home, my ticks have all stopped. Page 193, Our Town. We're doing the play Our Town for the spring show this year. Olivia dares me to try out for the lead role, the stage manager. And somehow I get it. Total fluke. Never got any lead roles in anything before. I tell Olivia she brings me good luck. Unfortunately, she doesn't get the female lead, Emily Gibbs. The pink-haired girl named Miranda gets it. Olivia gets a, a bit part and is also the Emily understudy. I'm actually more disappointed that Olivia than Olivia is. She almost seems relieved. I don't love people staring at me, she says, which is sort of strange coming from such a pretty girl. A part of me thinks maybe she blew her audition on purpose. The spring show is at the end of April. It's mid-March now, so that that's less than six weeks to memorize my part plus rehearsal time, plus practicing with my band, plus finals, plus spending time with Olivia. It's going to be a rough six weeks, that's for sure. Mr. Davenport, the drama teacher, is already manic about the whole thing. Will drive us crazy by the time it's over, no doubt. I heard through the grapevine that he'd been planning on doing The Elephant Man, but changed it to Our Town at the last minute and that change took a week off our rehearsal schedule. Not looking forward to the craziness of the next month and a half. Page 194, Ladybug. Olivia and I are sitting on her front stoop. She's helping me with my lines. It's a warm March evening, almost like summer. The sky is still bright cyan, and the sun is low, and the sidewalks are streaked with long shadows. I'm reciting 
Yes, the sun's come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked the mountains a little bit more, and the rains have brought down some of the dirt. Some babies that weren't even born before have begun taking, talking regular sentences already. And a number of people who thought they were right young and spry have noticed that they can't bound up a flight of stairs like they used to without their heart fluttering a little. I shake my head. I can't remember the rest. All that can happen in a thousand days, Olivia prompts me, reading from the script. Right, 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 I say, shaking my head. I sigh. I'm wiped, Olivia. How the heck am I going to remember all these lines? You will, she answers confidently. She reaches out and cups her hand over a ladybug that appears out of nowhere. See? A good luck sign, she says, slowly lifting her top hand to reveal the ladybug walking on the palm of her other hand. Good luck, or just the hot weather, I joke. Of course good luck, she answers, watching the ladybug crawl up her wrist. There should be a thing about making a wish on a ladybug. Augie and I used to do that with fireflies when we were little. She cups her hand over the ladybug again. Come on, make a wish. Close your eyes. I dutifully close my eyes. A long second passes. Then I open them. Did you make a wish? She asks. Yep, she smiles. Uncups her hands and the ladybug, as if on cue, spreads its wings and flits away. Do you want to know what I wished for? I ask, kissing her. No, she answers shyly looking up at the sky, which, at this very moment, is the exact colour of her eyes. I made a wish too, she says mysteriously. But she has so many things she could wish for, I have no idea what she's thinking. <laughs>